Ready. All right, let's do this. So we're going to run through because uh, we're going to be recording this for other customers to watch at a later time. So we're going to run through our presentation. Um, yeah, this, this will be a great rehearsal. So as we go through it, we're going to have different folks speaking. Um, at the end, we'll have an opportunity for questions. We'll even have an opportunity um, for customers to meet with customer service reps and take a look at what their bill would look like post rate change. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jason Martin, and I'm the general interim general manager for Rancho Water. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate your time. Um, it's never an easy thing when we talk about raising rates, um, but we have an obligation to make sure that we're always providing service to our customers. And in order to be able to do that, we have to make sure that financially we're secure in our ability to provide that service. Um, what you're going to hear today is a, is a process that we go through when we develop our rates. You're going to hear about our cost of service study. You're going to hear about the rate setting process. You're going to hear about what we've done as an agency, both internally and advocating externally um, to make sure that we keep those costs down. And then lastly, you'll hear a little bit about what we can do to help our customers reduce their overall water use. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Alex Bugby. He's our rate consultant with Corolo, who helped us with our cost of service study. Thanks, Jason. Um, so as Jason said, I'm uh, Alex Bugby with um, Corolo Engineers, and we help to develop the cost of service study and um, kind of go through the whole process of actually developing the rates. So, you know, the slide that we're looking at now is really overviewing kind of the general goals and what we set out to do whenever we do any sort of water, wastewater cost of service study. So what we look at is, you know, first a comprehensive evaluation of the revenue requirements. And, you know, you may hear that term sort of thrown out, thrown around a little bit more. And what revenue requirements means is we're determining what is the total amount of money that needs to be generated by user rates such that those rates can support all of the costs that the district needs to incur? So purchasing water, operating the system, any sort of administrative costs, but also any capital costs that need to be supported by rates, subtract off any revenues that we're getting in from other sources, such as property taxes. And then that remainder is the amount that we actually have to set the rates to collect. Once we've determined that, then we go through cost of service analysis so that we can figure out, you know, of that amount that we know we need to collect, who ought to be paying it based on how they're using the system. So we distribute those costs in a fair and equitable manner to each of the customers of the system. Um, as we're doing the planning, we always look at, you know, kind of a, um, a mid to long-term horizon. So you know, if you saw on your uh, Proposition 218 notice, we're proposing three years of rates, but we also look beyond that over a five-year and 10-year time frame, so that we can be sure that whatever we're doing now, we're kind of promoting financial sustainability, um, you know, into the future as well, so that we're not ending up needing to have another big increase in year four because we didn't, you know, implement sufficient increases in years one through three. Um, and also as we're doing that, looking at things like regulatory compliance, changes in water supply that may be coming down the road so that we can get those integrated in and make sure that we're setting everything up for success in the future. And then, you know, particularly here in Rancho where, you know, where you have the water budget rates, really evaluating those rates, evaluating the tiers and how we're developing the cost for each of those tiers so that we're meeting the revenue requirements um, while also promoting conservation and using that tiered rate structure to collect uh, revenues from the right users based on how they're utilizing the system. So uh, kind of the general study approaches, and we sort of touched on some of this already as we start off with a policy and rate structure review. So look at the existing rate structure, look at the um, financial and operational policies of the district, any other changes or you know things that might be coming down the line as far as uh, you know changes in water supplies, other sort of out outside influencing factors and figure out, okay, you know, how do we develop our, our rate analysis and our, our cost of service study to account for those? We then go into the revenue requirement um, and funding needs analysis to figure out those revenue requirements the overall, how much money do we need to collect through rates? We do a demand analysis where we look at historical customer billing records um, and actually, you know, down to the, uh, the customer level, you know, we looked for this uh, study in particular, we looked back five years uh, worth of uh, customer demand analysis 
And we utilize that to inform our projected demands going forward and figure out which types of users are, are using water, when are they using water throughout the course of the year, and you know how might how do we how can that inform our projected um, our projected demands going forward? And you know ultimately that becomes the denominator for our rate equation. So we need to know how much water is being used by each different type of user and within each tier so that we can calculate the appropriate rates. We then do our, our cost allocation analyses, and that's where we allocate costs to be collected through the fixed meter charges or the variable tiered rates. And we also look at you know, allocations to functional groups where we take all of those O&M costs from the system and you know, allocate those out based on you know, what's being done for uh, to operate the distribution system, what's related to purchasing supplies, what's related to you know, other overhead admin type costs and so forth, and you know, incorporate that into the rate design analysis so that we can appropriately recover those costs from each user. Throughout the process, we you know, worked on you know, doing a lot of collaboration, um, engagement and messaging, particularly with the board of directors and the ad hoc committee. So at each step of the way, we were working closely with them um, you know, to kind of show them what we were ending up with for our overall revenue requirement needs, overall rate increases, explaining demand projections to them, the cost of service analysis, and, and ultimately the rates. And that you know brings us to here, where we've completed the um, the draft study with all of their input, and are you know kind of bringing it forward and and uh, trying to present everything to the public as well. And so, just to to touch a little bit more on what drives the development of the rates and what the rates are actually you know here to accomplish is that we need to make sure that we're developing rates that are reflecting the cost incurred to provide service to each customer. And you know, for a lot of people who aren't in the water industry or um, you know other sorts of infrastructure industries, they turn on the tap, we see water come out, and you know the idea is that it's always there for you and it's ready to go. You don't you don't notice that it's gone until it is. But behind that, having that service and um, and you know being able to have on demand water, there's a lot that goes into it. So starting off with source and production where um, you know, we've got local groundwater that the district owned rights, owns rights to, but we're also purchasing recharge water from Metropolitan Water District and infiltrating that. We're then producing it back up out of the aquifers you know, through well systems, treating that water to get it ready to be distributed to the customers, going through the transmission and distribution um, systems where we're needing to you know, uh, store that water after it's been uh, produced and treated, but then also deliver that water to all the different areas within each of the water divisions, um, particularly where, where that comes into play is in the elevation zones where, you know, we've got, I think, 10 or 12 different elevation zones within each of the divisions, and each of those zones requires a specific amount of energy input to actually get the water up to the elevation where it can be uh, served to the customers who are located there. And so when we develop water rates, we're looking at what are the costs of all these different physical elements of the system and everything it's taking to get water you know, from the source to the customers? But then on top of this, we also have all the costs that it takes to manage um, all of those different processes. Uh, and so from there, I'm gonna pass it off to Kathy Naylor, who's the CFO of the district to walk through the budget and uh, more of the revenue requirements items. Thanks, Alex. Just gonna lower it here. Okay. So Alex gave a great overview of the process that we go through in order to set our rates. Um, we go through multiple legal requirements. We wanna make sure everything is fair and equitable for our customers. And from there, we develop a budget um, from which goes through many discussions with our board members. Um, and we go back to the drawing table several times to make sure that we're coming up with the most efficient and effective way to serve our customers. Uh, this year, looking at the 24-25, this was a really important year because that is what really kicked off the baseline for our five-year cost of service study. Um, from there, we are projecting out over five years, looking at trends, things, not only um, regular sources of um, 
water and energy, but also where we think um, our general overall costs are gonna go. And this graph right here is uh, depicting that we have a $93 million budget. When we started this process, it was upwards of $96 million. And going back, this is our operating budget alone, we had gone back and looked for every efficiency that we could find and reduced um, our operating budget for our start kickoff year 24 and 25 by over two and a half million dollars just by making sure that we're focusing on efficiencies and prioritization. Um, and as you can see, this graph is depicting uh, the biggest chunk of our costs are really related to what Alex had just walked through, our source of supply. That's 50% of our operating budget, it's about $50 million. That's just from receiving our water and treating it and getting the water itself to our customers. Um, energy also plays a huge component. We've got 9% um, of our overall budget is just energy alone. And Alex had mentioned that's really key in not only operating our facilities, but really pumping our water into the different zones of our district. And then lastly, we have about 37% uh, of our uh, operating budget is really our systems operations. That's everything that goes into materials, supplies, outside services, uh, labor into really treating that water and getting that to our customers. So taking a look at our major cost drivers of the, in, of the increases alone, um, we are seeing numbers from the Metropolitan Water District where we receive about 50% of our water either treated or untreated. Um, and the rate increases over the next two years are upwards of 18%. Uh, we have, they started off much higher than that. Um, we had uh, our board of directors um, as well as our staff had attended uh, multiple meetings, both with MET and with our member agencies who represent us to discuss um, why these costs are driving up so high, um, looking at their business model, making sure that their, their cost recovery um, is, is really a function currently, MET's um, cost recovery is a function of how much water they sell. So it's that variable component. The more water they sell, the more revenue that they have to uh, recover those costs. However, that is not enough to really sustain the system. And so what we're advocating for is um, both looking at the efficiencies of their programs, making sure that MET is really focusing on their core responsibilities of providing water, as well as looking at their rate structure. Um, our rate structure at Rancho Water has uh, two main components, really. We have our fixed cost recovery built into the rates and property taxes, and then as well as our variable rate recovery, which is based on the amount of water that you actually use. Um, METS was not structured as such, and therefore when the revenues dropped based off of um, less demand, uh, they needed to increase their rates in order to recover those things. And we just feel, you know, on behalf of our customers that that's really an unacceptable way of, of handling this business. And it's really hitting home to not only to the uh, consumers that are single family residents, but we have a lot of ag users out here. And that is their number one, one of their number one main drivers of their costs into their businesses is, is the cost of water. So we're fighting hard to get met to understand and as well as Edison um, and, and uh, SoCal Gas that these are really not only affecting people in their homes, but it's also affecting their livelihood. And so, we're looking at 18% rate increase over two years from Metropolitan alone. We're looking, um, projected in there is the natural gas projection increase of about 8%. And then SoCal Edison is projected to increase about 10%. So what does this mean to us? Well, we have two main divisions here. We've got the Rancho Division and the Santa Rosa Division. Uh, the two have very similar needs as far as what their infrastructure looks like, how many um, acres that they have out there and the system that is in place to get the water to our customers. However, Rancho has a much broader customer base than Santa Rosa, and it really shows um, that Rancho can recuperate more spreading it over a larger customer base, and Santa Rosa has much less uh, customers to share in those costs. Uh, the difference between the projected rate increases for Rancho and Santa Rosa, that 1% difference is really that Santa Rosa doesn't have enough um, property tax revenue to really support 
their infrastructure needs, both current and projected needs to help with our re the replacement costs. And that difference really is about a 1% in their, in their current rate structure. The Rancho division uh, has enough to sustain them um, with between debt service and their property tax revenue. And therefore they don't actually have a capital component built within their rate structure. And that's really the main difference. Another thing that you'll see here is we have noticed for a three year rate increase, and really that allows us to look at um, a expanded period. Alex had already talked about why that's important so that we're not inflating things for one year in response to certain cost drivers. And we're really looking at the future as well, making sure that we don't look at small rate increases now, and then that would drive you know, double digit increases in the future. So all of those things are important in having our customers have the ability to plan for their future. Um, another thing that we did, and, and this is on one of our future slides, but you can clearly see it here, is we have always had our rate increases hit during our fiscal year, which starts July 1. Well, that's really hard for our ag users because they're on a calendar year. Their budgets are on a calendar year with their budget-based tiered rates. And uh, MET also increases their um, their water costs on and their rates on January 1. So we are now shifting to a January 1 rate increase going forward. Uh, we can't just ignore the costs that are in front of us now, otherwise we're gonna be behind the ball and having to play catch up, which would cause even more of a rate increase. So what we decided to do is we pass through the, the part of the rates that have nothing to do with the actual import water costs, and that's going to hit July 1. And then on January 1, when MET increases their rates, we will be then increasing our rates just to capture that increase from the Metropolitan Water District. And then every year after that, we will be on a January 1 um, cycle. And this is really taking a look at history. We are digging ourselves out of a little bit of, hole, of a hole. Um, during COVID, we had had an approved rate increase from our board of directors, and they had determined that we really needed to um, pay attention to what was going on in our community and help out our community. And they voted to um, withhold those rate increases, and we had no rate increases during uh, July of uh, 2020 through May of 2021. And, and what happens during that time frame is inflation had hit and it continued to grow. And then after that, we had three years of approved rates that were nowhere near at the level of cost recovery for what inflation was doing. This graph right here depicts in the dark part in the back is what was going on with inflation. That's not accumulative, that's just um, a month over month increase in inflationary factors. And then those straight lines are where our rate increases were over there. So you can clearly see we had no rate increases for the first year, and then we had lower rate increases than what we actually needed in response to what was going on with the inflationary factors. This is that cumulative look of what that did to us. That red line is where inflation took our cost drivers. And the difference between that and Santa Rosa's rates and Rancho's rates is really that cost recovery gap, trying to get us back on track without really gouging our customers in one year having this rate shock of, now we have to play catch up and we're gonna increase your rates over one year. And that was really the important part of looking over a five year period in order to smooth those impacts out. And then this is a comparison to our neighboring agencies. Um, you know, it's hard to talk about rate increases. If you don't know where you started, you don't really know where you're winding up. And um, it's, it's difficult because everybody has a different rate structure. They might, may be in the middle of a, a three-year rate um, model that they've already approved. They may be um, starting again next year. They may be two years out. So given where we're at right now, this moment snapshot in time, you can see um, the very last line is, is the Rancho Division's current rate structure. And the proposed rate structure is, the, is right next to it. And then Santa Rosa also, their current rate structure is kind of mid in the mid pack. Um, as well as their proposed rate structure. And you can clearly see from this graph that we're still providing um, water to our customers at the, the most effective cost recoveries we can and really making sure that we're, we're doing everything as efficiently as possible for our customers. What else are we doing to help? Well, Rancho is, I've mentioned in the beginning that we decreased our operating budget by $2.5 million from our additional uh, 
initial draft. Um, and we did that by really looking at conservative demand forecasting and reviewing all of our planned activities and looking for cost savings. Uh, we also took a hard look at all of our planned capital projects. We looked at prioritization. Does this still really make sense for our customers? Is this really focusing on our core needs of providing uh, the most cost-effective water? And we reduced our capital projects that were planned by $15 million. Um, we also phased in rates over five-year planning period, which we already discussed, and changing to that calendar year-end to help um, mirror against the ag budgets and follow those rate changes. And then we also are really, we've bolstered our grant program. Um, we've been going after every other people's money that we can to really help with our customers. And we currently have over $35 million in active grants to help with those capital projects. Other things that we're doing, I already mentioned advocating. We're advocating not only at the local level, the state level, and the federal level. Um, we're looking for cost-saving legislation that really shows through with our grants. Um, we have solar facilities that we're maintaining. Uh, we have a very, very lean staff, and our board of directors really takes it to heart. If we ask for even one additional FTE, we have to provide them with cost um, analysis on uh, cost analysis on what kind of benefit this is and what are the needs for that. Um, and we have been um, applying for grants. We lease out any um, applicable facilities that we own, and we are participating in all the customer assistance programs and rebates that are provided to us to encourage water sustainability. And then to give a little bit more detail on that, Danielle is going to come up and, and speak a little bit more on, on the grant funding opportunities. Good afternoon, I'm Danielle Coates. I'm our Senior Government and Public Affairs Manager at Rancho California Water District. Um, building off of all that Kathy shared, we are very aggressive on looking for external funding from our state, federal, and local partners. And we just wanted to showcase some of the grants that we have been successful in getting, but they to not only offset the cost of today, but looking longer term on how we can deliver projects and water supplies more cost effectively and more reliable, reliably. So that way we can continue to build on all the good work that Rancho has done to ensure um, sustainability for our region. So our, we are very fortunate to have a wonderful groundwater bank below our feet. So, but it does require some additional infrastructure to be built so that we're able to access and inject some water into our groundwater basin. We've been successful to date in receiving over $11 million in external funding. So that goes a long way towards helping us build out that program. Um, as Kathy indicated, energy is one of our biggest cost drivers. We are advancing a uh, inline hydroelectric facility, and we are grateful to our Riverside County Supervisor, Chuck Washington, who has, through ARPA funds, which are federal dollars um, that were streamed to the county, we've received three and a half million dollars to help advance that program. Overall, once that, that uh, infrastructure is built out, that will have an annual cost reduction of $300,000 on energy savings for our district, which is fantastic. On the, on the water supply reliability and on wildfire mitigation, we, are, we have received dollars for our Carancho pump station improvement that is on um, uh, up and towards the mountainy areas of our facility that will help move water around, creating redundancy that ultimately will possibly look at advancing some future wildfire uh, mitigation facilities that could include an, a rapid aerial uh, hydration pond for helicopter usage. We've been very successful with our local crop swap program, which is intended to help our ag growers and our agricultural community um, change out some of their high water using crops for lower water using varietals. Um, that program, has been so successful, we received $5 million from the Department of Water Resources to expand that program to help our, all of our agriculture customers, as well as those in Northern San Diego, to make sure that they're able to take advantage of water using, water using reducing opportunities, pardon me. And um, so we did receive again a $5 million to advance that program. So we also, um, in looking at the work that Metropolitan Water District has done to increase our water rates, 
we wanted to make it clear that we have been very active in communicating how those potential rate impacts will translate to customers at the local level. We've again worked with our local customers, our local representatives through Eastern Municipal Water District and Western Municipal Water District. Both of those are our regional representative to the Metropolitan Water District. We've issued letters, we spoke at their board meetings, we've worked actively, we've had them come here, and they have been good partners in communicating to Metropolitan that these impacts will be significant to not only our urban customers, but to our agriculture customers. And in that regard, our board of directors has been very active and out in the community and, and advocating on behalf of the customers as well. Um, we did have one of our board of directors attend uh, the Metropolitan Water District workshop where they were doing the rate increase and actively share our story out here to remind them that we have a robust agriculture community and that, that what those impacts will look like for our community. And to that end, we are fortunate that there was some re, um, listening at Metropolitan. They did work with us and they look to work to, with us in the future. I think we've been successful in carving out a voice and a space at the local level in terms of working both with our regional partners as well as Metropolitan Water District. But we are going to actively continue to monitor the conversation on their business plan development, on their rate changes, so that way we can continue to have a voice in this space on behalf of all of you. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Kimmy, who's gonna to talk to you about some of our tools and resources and rebates. Thank you. Hello, I'm Kimmy Wall, Public Affairs Manager for the District. And as Danielle mentioned, uh, we do have a number of programs here at the district that we either handle ourselves or that we partner with other agencies to help you save water, to change out your landscape, um, and to just find new ways to conserve water. So some of the financial assistance tools, we have a turf replacement program that we partner with SoCal Water Smart. Um, and right now, it's usually $2 a square foot for residential. Right now, they have a special going on for $3 a square foot. Um, so you can take out any of your grass type stuff and move it over to more water efficient California native friendly plants. Um, and there's a new tree bait program with that as well. So if you're going to add trees, you can get $100 per tree up to five trees at your landscape as well. Um, we have landscape equipment, financial assistance, and indoor appliances, many rebates. So um, there's a really robust rebate program that if you're thinking about doing any sorts of appliances or outdoor sprinklers, it's best to check those websites and see what kind of rebates you can get because a lot of times you can get most of that cost covered. Uh, we do have some technical assistance programs. And as you can see in the poster right here, we have a My Water Tracker program um, that allows you to go into real time and see your water use. And so you can track your water budget. Um, you can see if you're getting close to your budget on a daily basis if you're going over um, and it's great for checking leaks too so we have a leak alert program um, that you can it'll give you automatic updates if you if it's detecting a leak at your property and my water tracker is great for that too if you think you fixed a leak you can go back into my water tracker and take a look and see if it's actually still using water or if you've maybe fixed the leak on your own uh, we have free landscape evaluations. You can apply and you can have an auditor come out to your house and for a free evaluation, just tell you how you can be saving water at your landscape. Um, many online resources, if you go to the website at the bottom, which is ranchowater.com slash rebates, uh, many programs that are listed on there. And we do have uh, upcoming workshops throughout the year. And so these are some of the ones that we've had in the past um, and that will be coming back around. We partner with G3 Garden Group quite a bit. We've had garden tours around the area to see neighborhood houses that have switched over to water efficient landscapes and how you might do that at your house. Um, and then we have online classes with G3 Water, um, G3 Garden Groups that you can join in right from your living room. So in many written materials, there is um, a uh, handout out front that is really great for walking you through. It's almost a concierge of how to walk you through to get your rebates, to get a landscape evaluation. It'll tell you exactly which buttons to push on the website because it can get a little bit overwhelming. And then uh, finally, we have Rancho In Bloom. So this is the uh, Temecula Marietta In Bloom website that we launched last year. Um, it's a dedicated landscape for Rancho Water customers. You can go on and it has um, a really a step-by-step -step on how to transform your garden into a landscape that is water efficient. So it'll help you get inspired. You can look at different plants, different landscapes, actual pictures of people's landscapes and say, oh, I like that plant, I like that tree. Um, I think it might look good in my yard. You can make a plant list actually on the website and then print that out and go straight to a nursery and 
actually say, these are the plants I would like for my garden. And then it will help you with uh, contractors. And so Get In Bloom has a whole list of contractors that are local. So if you want a designer, if you want an actual landscaper, if you're looking for nurseries, it's all listed right on there. And it is ranchoinbloom.com that you can go check that out. So with that, that is the end of our presentation. Um, a couple housekeeping things. We are gonna have our lovely customer assistance team in the back who will be there to help you if you'd actually like to pull up your account, your actual account and see how it's going to affect you with these proposed rate changes. They can look that up for you. Um, we are going to have staff here to answer any questions. We've got these poster boards that you're welcome to come take a look at. This one right here has the average monthly bill impacts. Um, so you can actually see what the difference in the impacts would be if these go through. Um, and we, we are thankful that you showed up and thank you for coming to hang out with us. Again, our staff will be here. If you have any um, questions about the presentation, we are happy to take those. And I would invite the rest of my team to come back on up. Any questions from our attendees? And if not, we'll just open it to open house style. Okay. All right. Well, with that, we will be here for another hour and 20 minutes. So please come up, chat with us, and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much for coming out today. Thanks, everybody.